Thank you very much, Giovanna. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to be the first speaker at this conference, which I think covers in a very interesting topic, a very relevant topic. And my goal today is to give you an introduction into this topic. We're dealing with change that is propelled by digitalization and that offers new opportunity, but also challenges for everyone involved and touched by this. Um, what I'm going to be doing in the next 30 minutes approximately is uh, to give you an overview of what I think is relevant about this topic. I'm going to touch upon a couple of definitions because I think it's very important that we get on the same page with respect to this topic. And I'm going to show you a bit more details um, of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm an economist myself, so I can't talk about this topic without going into some of the economic properties, the economic characteristics of digital platforms, because I think that um, makes up a lot of the dynamic that we, uh, that we see. And then, as I'm from Germany, where um, this topic is intensely discussed, um, I'm going to be talking about the relevance of digital labor platforms in particular because in Germany we have a couple um, people that, that are of the opinion that, that they are not important, they're not relevant yet, whereas others say they're very rele relevant and they're going to be changing the way we work and that work is being enabled. So this is going to be um, the second point of my presentation. And as you're going to be hearing a lot about the challenges and opportunities about digital labor platforms over the course of this conference, I'm going to just quickly touch upon a couple of those issues as well. So starting... Um, Starting uh, with the economic side of things, um, we all know that work is going to be changing and that work has already changed. And just to illustrate this point and, and look at what's different this time, I'm going to show you two pictures of the title page of the German magazine Der Spiegel. Um, this one is from 2016 and it's basically about the threat that digitalization might pose to jobs. And then I'm going to show you a second one. This is from 1979. And although it's not quite the same picture, it's the same fear that's behind it, namely that something's being changed in the workplace for the workforce, and there's a fear that's, um, that accompanies this. And this is what's the same. In uh, the late 1970s, it was uh, the fear of automation. Now it's the fear of digitalization. And while the issues are similar, they're not the same. What's the same is that there is a relevance to it because there's, there's change. Um, the topic that we're dealing with um, at this conference is digital platforms. And this is a new topic, a rather new topic. And to illustrate this point, I made up this graph just randomly, more or less randomly, selecting um, digital platforms um, and the year they were founded. And as you can see, Amazon.com is one of the first platforms on this list. It's definitely not the first one ever to be around, but from a digital platform um, point of view, it's one of the first ones, and it was founded in the 1990s. So this is a rather new topic, and you can see a lot of dynamic looking at recently founded companies all over the globe that belong in this overall category. And what is this category? Um, from an economist's point of view, I'm always scared that people will misunderstand what a platform really is. So I'm, I have to talk about this issue now, and I'm sorry if you already, if we're on the same page already. If we're not, we're probably, hopefully, on the same page after this slide. A platform, for a platform to be a platform, it's necessary that you have at least two user groups, and this is what I find is most often misunderstood or misconstrued. The platform itself then in allows interaction between those groups, and that's its, purp its purpose, to allow for this interaction, to allow, allow for transactions um, between the groups or for interaction of, of different kinds. And I'm going to come back to this in a, in a little bit. And the goal of the platform is to create value for each of the groups. This is important as well. It's it's, basic, it's, it's a rather simple concept, because if there wasn't a benefit attached for each of the groups, um, they wouldn't participate. So that's a very, very important um, important issue. So keeping that in mind, um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the economic um, properties, the economic characteristics of um, digital platforms that make them um, grow rather quickly or that offer the possibility of quick growth. Um, the first one is network effects. That means it's a 
for each user, it's beneficial if more users um, use a certain platform. In, in case of labor platforms, these network effects are mostly indirect, meaning that for service providers on these platforms, it's beneficial if there's a lot of customers on the other side, that's the other user group. Um, and for, for the customers themselves, it's beneficial if there's more service providers, because both means more choice, uh, respectively more demand. So this is what network effects are about, and they're a character, typical characteristic of platforms. The second one is economies of scale. We have, for all of these platforms, we have rather high fixed costs, meaning the initial installment of the platform, the upkeep of the platform. These are fixed costs that are comparatively high. Um, at the same time, we have very low variable costs, so an additional user can be served at, at a cost of virtually nothing, meaning that it's very cheap once you have incurred the initial fixed cost to cater to additional users on all sides of the platform. Um, both of these um, characteristics make it really easy and really cheap as well for platforms to grow large quickly. The main reason why platforms are beneficial in a sense compared to other business models is that they reduce transaction costs. Transaction costs are made up of different aspects and I'm, just to give you a quick example, this slide shows on the left-hand side um, how you would go about finding physical labor. Think of you need someone to paint your house. And the right-hand side shows how you'd go about it using a digital labor platform that is specialized in this area. So you have, on the one hand, certain information costs. If you go to the yellow pages and you just look through who's painting houses, you just call a couple people, talk to them about their conditions, about their availability. If you use the platform, these costs are a lot lower because you have a transparent overview of who's available, what rates they um, take for, for performing a task, and so on. So search and information costs are the main part of, tra of um, transaction costs that can be saved using platforms with, in comparison to um, going about it a different way. Then there's bargaining and decision costs, meaning negotiations about a price. Usually this is facilitated by platforms as well. It very much depends on the platform we're talking about, how far uh, prices are, um, are being um, transparent um, at, uh, up front, how far there's actually negotiation still. With some platforms there are negotiations, so depending on the platform, the bargaining and decision costs might be lower but don't have to be. The more involved the platform is, the lower the transaction costs are. And then we have policy and enforcement costs, that is um, how to organize payments. If you are in individual negotiations with different contractors, you need to talk to them about the methods of payment they're accepting. In case of labor platforms, it might be the same if you get um, just, uh, just pick a contractor f via the platform and then negotiate payment with them themselves. But in some cases, the platform is involved as well. And this lowest transaction costs if it's, if it's transparent on the platform how to pay. Obviously, this has its challenges as well. I'm not going to go into that at this point, but just so you know, this is just from a transaction cost point of view. Transaction costs are lower using platforms, and mainly because of the search and information costs. So um, digital platforms come in all different sorts of shapes and types, and we're talking about digital labor platforms today. And even those, I'm going to go into that in, in a little bit, even those are quite... Um, quite different. There's quite a few different types. In addition to that, we have search platforms, we have social networks, we have marketplace platforms, and we have sharing economy platforms. And this is why I'm showing the slide just to make a point, namely that there's overlaps between these different types. It's hard for some platforms to be categorized into one category. So take Uber as an example. That is a digital labor platform because a service is being traded. At the same time, you could count it as a sharing economy platform. So it really depends on your point of view. And this is the approach I'm going to be taking today. All the platforms I mentioned are, from my point of view, digital labor platforms. But if you have a different, um, if you have a different opinion, please feel free to you know, interrupt me and correct me at any time. 
so um, talking about digital labor platforms, um, we come to the point where, where it's necessary to look at what exactly makes, uh, makes, makes them up and then how relevant, how relevant they really are. Um, I said earlier that we need at least two user groups for most digital labor platforms. We have service providers as one user group and then we have the customers as the other user groups. There might be a third user group, namely advertisers, depending on the platform, for example. There might be even different, um, different user groups, but those are the two typical ones that make up most um, digital labor platforms. And then there's two types of work that we're talking about mostly. That's physical work, meaning the service provider and the customer are physically in the same place. That is the painter example that I used earlier, for example. And then the other type is virtual work. That means someone sitting at their computer and doing some work for you as a service provider, but they don't have to be in the same place. They could be, but they don't have to be. This is um, everything, basically, that can be done digitally where you just get as a result of the um, service performed, you get a spreadsheet, you get some sort of paperwork sent, some data sent. So this is, this is two types of work, and I think the implications of these two types of work are quite different. This is why I'm talking about this in so much depth, because I think we need to differentiate also looking at challenges and opportunities, what we're really talking about. Um, even with virtual work, there's you can further differentiate, and I'm sorry that I'm going into so much detail. Just preparing this talk, I kind of thought it's necessary to, to especially since I'm the first speaker, starting, starting basically at zero and building up from there. So first of all, for virtual tasks, there's the, there's the possibility that it's just an individual task that goes to one service provider. You might... And this is often the case, um, we're often talking about companies contracting uh, this sort of work out. Um, you might have a task su such as uh, translating some sort of text, and you just contract that out to a service provider that knows the language you want to have your paper translated to. The other um, possibility is crowd working or click working or micro working, as we call it. That means you have an individual task as well, but it's further divided up into small tasks, into so called micro tasks that can be performed by one or several service providers. So you, you take your project and you divide it into thin slices, the, the smallest slice possible, and then you find someone who's specialized to do just this part of the project that you need to be, that you need to. Um, have support on. And when we're talking, a lot of the discussion, and I'm talking from a German viewpoint now, a lot of the discussion that we have in Germany is on these types of platforms that facilitate crowd working. And this is just, just one part of the whole, the overall topic. So um, I'm going to be talking about this a little more now, and I'm going to come back to the physical labor platforms um, as well. So if we are talking about crowd working, there's a five-stage process that a company that contracts out some work goes through. That is first to define what the task is, what's the problem, what's the challenge, and then to post this on one of the platforms available, and there are several, and launch a call or launch a competition that service providers can react to and can offer their proposals. Then the third step is to gather these proposals. The fourth is to evaluate them and to select someone or several people in most cases. And then after the fourth step, there's the actual work to be done. And for the um, customer, for the company that contracted out some sort of work, um, there's then the fifth step of deciding what to do with the people that were being used for this task because they have gained experience. They might be valuable for a further project, especially if you have something similar. Or you might decide, okay, this, this didn't work out, or we just had this task once, and we might not need them. And this whole process is really not that different from what contracting out a task usually involves. I think, from my point of view, the main difference is that you really divide up the task. And um, usually, if a company decides to take something that they, that they do and contract it out to someone else, they take the whole bunch and find someone who can deal with the whole package. So I think that's the, ma that's the main difference here, except for the use of technology, obviously. But that's up for discussion as well. So um, I 
tried looking for some data. Um, I'm, I'm very data uh, based, so I'm, I tried looking for some data on crowd working and on uh, digital labor platforms overall. I came across a study for German ICT companies that were being asked, uh, do you use crowd working for your tasks? And it seems, well, for me, when I started reading this, I thought, you know, this is the industry that's most likely, that's most prone to actually use um, crowd working because they, their tasks are digital by definition, by nature, and it should be easy to, you know, source some of that out. So of the German ICT companies in the survey, and it's a representative survey of those who even knew what crowd working was, only 4% said they had used it. And it's a survey from 2015, so the data are kind of old, but still, I found that surprising. And that, from, from my viewpoint, means we're still in the early stages of something. And another a piece of data that I found seems to support this there's data on um, so called power turkers on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Power turkers are people that are very, very active. Overall, around 500,000 people worldwide are registered on Amazon Mechanical Turk to perform these tasks. Of those, only 40,000 are active, meaning they actually do something. They actually um, are service providers regularly, more or less regularly. Yeah. And of those 40,000, 20% perform 80% of the tasks. So that's 8,000 people. That's the number that you see on this slide. Those are the ones, and that's a worldwide number, so it's not a whole lot of people. Given it's just one platform, it's just one piece of data, but just, just to give you an impression, the impression I got is that we're still talking about something that's very, very much in development still. And so the, the um, positive outlook on this is that there's still a lot that we can do to shape this and to look at which way do we want, want this to go. Um, I looked at some more data, and um, I, I found this, which is a study by um, two um, geography scholars from the Oxford Internet Institute, and they looked at who is actually a service provider on odesk.com, another micro-work um, website, another micro-work platform. And uh, the larger the dots are in this, in this graph, the more people per internet population are active at a given point of time. And you see it's, it's a whole working week, or a whole week, basically, not only working week. And everything that's in brown is Asia. So there's two countries that are very active here, and that's the Philippines and Bangladesh. And there's a couple of um, European countries, those are the blue ones, namely Ukraine and Moldova, where people are very active on this platform. But in the European countries, you can see there's no one active during the night. They, they are just active during the day and mostly during the work week. So Saturday, Sunday, those are the on the on the edges of this of this graph. So it seems to be crowd working seems to be very much a regional have a regional perspective, a regional aspect here. Yeah. So that's all the data as well. That's true. And there could have been some changes there, obviously. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, if I would expect that to have changed much, but, but you're right. These are even older data than the ones I, so, I showed you before. But I'm going to come back to the data issue because I think that we need some data on this to, to be sure what we're talking about. And I'm going to come back on what's being done in that area as well. Um, I have another older study from 2015. This is by the EU agency uh, Eurofound. Um, this is um, an, an EU agency that um, is working to improve working conditions in the European Union. And they asked the, the institutions working for them to kind of rate their own country with respect to whether crowd working is emerging or not. I found this, this graph interesting, especially because you can see Portugal, Spain, Italy and, and Greece, and those are the countries mostly affected by the uh, financial crisis, being rated as emerging, whereas the Netherlands, where we are today, is being rate, rated as not emerging. And maybe we can talk about this uh, impression um, in a little more depth later on. I don't, um, I don't know, because the study didn't specify what this rating was based on. I just thought it's, it's quite interesting that there seems to be a difference. And I'm not sure that we would see the same picture if we looked at it from today's viewpoint. So coming back to physical work, um, I was just going to say a couple of words on um, how uh, there has been a development path towards where we are today with digital labor platforms that facilitate physical work. And that is coming from the directory type 
a way of finding someone to perform a task, that is the Yellow Pages, for example, on to a general digital platforms like Craigslist, or in Germany we have Kaleido, to monothematic digital platforms like um, Helpling, or Listminute in Belgium, or MyHammer in Germany. The, um, the reason why we, we saw this, or why we see this transition, is that transaction costs are lower, and I talked about this a little bit uh, earlier on using the painter example, but also transparency is a lot, is a lot higher with the monothematic platforms where you can l look at um, availability prices all at the same time without even having to speak to someone. Um, I'm going to take this, this development path and think of the two extremes, the directory on the one hand side and then the monothematic platform on the other side. And I'm going to show you some data on this that I um, personally collected last year. Um, this is a comparison of the German platform MyHammer, which is a platform for a craftsman, if you need a painter, if you need an electrician, this sort of thing. And it's the one platform to go to for this type of work in Germany compared to the Yellow Pages. And for five German cities, you can see the uh, share of craft, craftsmen on myhammer.de versus the number in the Yellow Pages. Just to give you, you an example of what this means, for Cologne, you can see 10.5 for painters. This means for 100 painters in the Yellow Pages, there's 10 on my hammer. So it still seems to be kind of emerging, although I know no one using the Yellow Pages personally, and everyone's using my hammer for this type of service to contract that out. But what we see is that it seems to depend a bit on the trade as well, particularly looking at the floor tilers. Electricians are even worse than the painters, but the floor tilers, for Berlin, you can see that there's 150 floor tilers on my hammer DE compared to 100 in the Yellow Pages. And I should add, possibly, to, for you to, to be able to, to judge this, is that my hammer certifies the, um, the craftsmen they use. So there's no one there that just does this as a hobby, but everyone has a qualification. Um, so what we see is that there's no um, homogenous picture, but it's very much diverse depending on what we're talking about, which craft we're talking about, and even regional differences. These are large German cities, and still there's a lot of differences in, in the way um, platforms are used versus the going about it the traditional way. So I talked a bit about how, um, how we need data. And um, just to give you um, a heads up on this, in case you haven't already heard it, that the U EU Commission is also interesting in this, interested in this aspect. And they've contracted out a project on um, digital labor platforms targeting EU citizens or using EU citizens as service providers. And the aim of this project is to measure the extent and the impact that digital labor platforms have in the European Union, um, to provide profiles of providers, to provide their background, to provide the amount of work, the prices, and also social security, social protection issues, uh, tax issues. Um, so it's a multi-country survey um, performed in 10 member states with about 20,000 uh, respondents um, that are expected. And this project wraps up by the end of this year. So hopefully we can have some more detailed data on the EU and digital labor platforms in the EU by next year, hopefully. So I'm going to come to my last point, and that is something that we're going to hear about a lot about um, during the course of this conference, I think, and that is what are the challenges and what are the opportunities associated with uh, digital labor platforms. Um, I'm going to go um, about this in a, in a threefold way. I'm going to look at service providers, customers, and the economy overall, because there are effects on, on basically every, every three of these, um, these groups. For service providers, opportunities are, for example, the flexibility of the work. That is flexibility of working hours, flexibility of where to work from, especially if we're talking about virtual work, flexibility of what kind of tasks to perform. So this is, this is a great opportunity for many people that makes it also easier to access the labor market for some people that ha don't have easy access at the moment due to other reasons such as caring for children or something like that. It might also lower the barriers to self-employment if you can try out working via such a platform on the you might um, want to um, just you might want to decide to actually go into self-employment do that full-time or not even full-time but as your main job um, it, and it might be more easy 
um, this way because you can try it out at, at the beginning and you can just see how it goes. For customers, there's also the flexibility opportunity, meaning there's a large choice of providers, there's um, great transparency, there's a flexibility in how to divide up tasks so you find someone who's specialized to do exactly what you need, and um, it's easier to find these people than it is in, in the non-digital world. Then there's a greater choice or a greater uh, knowledge of the choice that there is. It might not be that even that, that the choice is bigger, but it's just more transparent. Um, there's also, a, well, one argument in, in this area is also the choice of prices and the qualities that you can expect is, might, be, might be more diverse than what we're, what we're used to. And then possibly there might be cost savings. Um, cost savings due to the transparency or the transaction co action cost argument that I made earlier. But of course, and this is something that we're going to be talking about for certain, of course also because you might be able to contract something out as a company to another country where labor costs are just different than what we are um, experience in, experiencing in, in the European Union. For the um, economy, there are possible rebound effects. That means if prices are lower, and this results in a higher demand. If a greater transparency leads to a lower pricing level overall, because markups are not as easily possible, for example, this could result in a higher demand for such service. And this would be, po uh, this would be positive for the overall economy, um, of course. And then um, the argument, argument is sometimes being made, and I'm not quite sure how valid it is, is that it's possible that some of the activities that used to be um, performed in the black market without any um, social protection, without paying any taxes, might be transferred to digital labor platforms. And this is especially valid with respect to cleaning, as at least this is what the discussion is in, in um, Germany. While there are a lot of opportunities, there are also challenges, and I expect that we're going to be talking about this in, in more detail. For service providers, there are social risks um, associated, possibly associated with uh, working um, on a digital labor platform, risks such as occupational um, risks, uh, labor law issues, um, things like that, security issues, data uh, protection issues, all these sorts of, of um, challenges. Um, then the, especially if we're talking about companies contracting out tasks to micro workers, there's also a shift of the entrepreneurial risk to the individual because there's no regular payment. There's just being, um, a payment is just being made if uh, someone's actually working and compared to the alternative that this task is performed within a company by someone who's employed by this company uh, with all the, um, the benefits that go with that, um, that is, of course, a challenge. And then there's possibly a limitation of rights of the service providers if we're talking about rating systems. This is also an interesting discussion, um, the way that rating systems influence a digital um, work, digital labor. There might be some challenges there as well. For customers, and these um, challenges refer mostly, except for the last one, to virtual work, to crowd work. There's the uh, question of how to manage quality. There's the question of um, losing control over the process. If you slice it uh, in, in small pieces you, um, you, uh, and you do, don't do it in-house, you lose, might, might lose control over, um, over the whole process and the timing of the process, for example. And then there's um, losing in-house competencies, especially if you're taking something that used to be performed within a company and contract this out to, um, to micro workers. And then there's some legal risks involved, of course. What happens if something goes wrong? What, what law is applicable? And this is particularly um, relevant if we're talking about cross-border transactions. And this is, again, the area of virtual work then. For the overall economy, there might be risks for social security systems, especially if we're talking about large parts of the workforce working. Um, in a self-employed status, being responsible for paying into social security systems by themselves, being responsible for paying taxes by themselves. There might be some, um, some issues there, especially if they, um, if they miss their payments, if they don't pay in, and they might, be, uh, might need to, to, um, to use social security at a later point. This might be a strain on, on, the, uh, burden, on the financial, um, financial budget. 
And then possibly there's lower tax revenues. And I'm, I'm not so much talking about black market activities, although this is also an issue. If you think again about the companies contracting out their work and slicing it up into smaller pieces, they might, for the individual service provider, lie under a certain um, tax threshold. There might not even be, uh, it might not even be necessary for them to pay tax. Whereas if the company had done it, contracted it all out in one package or had done it themselves, there would have been a tax. So uh, this, even without taking into account people not paying taxes, this is an issue for the economy that might, um, might have an effect. Um, I talked earlier about the, um, the survey in Germany um, with respect to the, um, to, um, the crowd working issues. And you can see that this is the same survey that the main reason why, why the ICT companies are not using crowd working is that the tasks are not suitable. And then only second and third reasons are actually challenges that come, uh, are associated with it, like quality uh, management or insecurity about the uh, legal framework. And to come to an end, um, the question is, and um, we're talking about this a lot uh, in, during this conference, is where are we headed? It's kind of like we're in a rocket ship and we're trying to go to some place where it's nice and where we're happy and everyone has working conditions that are uh, useful and companies and other customers are happy with the results they get. But we don't know. We might just as well return to back to Earth, go back to where we were, because as I said earlier, my impression is that we're still at the beginning. Or we might go someplace where, we, where it's actually better than where we are today. And it's our um, opportunity to shape this. And ending with this, I wish you all a very happy conference. I hope you enjoy yourselves, have interesting conversations, learn a lot, and um, enjoy yourselves. Thank you.